news, whether it's local news, or whether it's world news, it's always something crazy going on. That there ain't nothing just positive going on. It's always most going to be something just the devil just very busy, make you want to shake your head every time. So we still know we're not going to get peace around us, but Jesus promised that he can give us peace within, amen, because he is the Prince of Peace, and that's what we need in our lives, amen? amen. Now, not to just sit here and advertise, but I just have to make a statement on uh, what somebody said earlier about the shirt I'm wearing today, and uh, it said that we all should be wearing this type of shirt. Yeah, I can't agree with that, but I got a little something better than that. Instead of just wearing it, we need to apply it to our hearts, amen. amen. We need to connect to Christ in the hearts because it ain't always what a person wears on the outside. It's always on the inside because just because I can wear five, ten crosses or have all this shirts that say Jesus, but the question is, am I following Jesus, amen? amen. So we need to connect to Christ within our hearts, Amen. amen. Yeah, so we just give God Almighty thanks for what he has done. Scripture says, have you not known, have you not heard, have you ever been told to you that God is the creator of all things? Have you not known? Do you not know? God is the creator of all things. We have to seek him. We have to follow him and follow his word. He gave the guideline. And then the word became flesh to show an example of how we should live. So therefore, we should study Christ and follow Christ and connect to Christ. Amen? Amen. That he is the almighty and creator of all things. That as we live in our days, we live in our days to get right with God. These last days are here, people. It's just a matter of time for wars for all around the world to kick off. And God is doing just like in the days of Noah giving man 120 days at that time to get right. And God is giving man every day to get right, to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins that you've been born of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. That we have to get ready. Don't let the devil distract you while you're on your walk with Christ. Amen? All right. We're going to get into our question and answer day. And uh, like I say, we got to I got quite a few questions that I like to answer that people have brought up topics to me that I say, well, I do it on a question and answer day just so like everyone can hear. And starting off, um, a person asked me, how is Abraham important to us and how are we his seed? To know Abraham, you have to understand what God did with Abraham. God blessed Abraham as a patriot of the family of Israel, which all becomes one. God respected Abraham for his faith. God represented uh, Abraham as his covenant that he gave to him and his seed toward the people. Now, I have to give it from the beginning, but Abraham was trusted because he believed in God over everything, including his very own family, to a point where I believe in Galatians, the third chapter, verse six, it says that for Abraham was a credit for righteousness because he believed in God. Now we all believe in God, right? But Abraham believed in God and obeyed God. That's why scripture says faith without works is dead. That if you have to have your faith, you have to show some type of works that let you know that you believe in God. And the only way that we can believe in God is go by his word. Amen. Going from the get-go, what Abraham was a credit for, that Abraham was under his father Terah, that Terah worshipped idol gods in the house of Terah, which was Abraham's father. Abraham moved away from his father and stayed with his great-great-grandfather, Noah, that was of the flood of the Noah's ark. That let you know that at times when Jesus said in Matthew 10th chapter, I come to put a father against his son and a mother against their daughter, that he didn't come to send peace, but a sword. That when you start to follow Christ and you let the word of God dwell in you richly, you start to see things a little bit different than others. And when it even comes to your very own family 
uh, it comes to people around you. You just don't want to be an active indulgent in anymore. So Abraham moved out from his father and stayed with his great grandfather because the scripture says in the book of Jashin and Left Chapter that Noah taught Abraham in the way of the Lord. Scripture says, train up a child in the way that he should go, that he should not depart from it. So the household has to be taught of the word of God. If your household don't have no word of God, then guess what that leaves room open for? It leaves room open for, for the devil. And so when you ain't got no God in the house, that room leaves room for the devil to take over. So keep Christ in your house. Keep the word of God in your house. Speak to your family about the word of God because if they ain't been taught it, the devil shows on maybe to teach them something. Then you have to fight that battle, amen? In the book of Joshua, in the letter chapter, I just want to show something. And in the 16th chapter, it says, Abraham came to his father's house and saw 12 gods standing in their temples. And the anger of Abraham was kindled when he saw the images in his father's house. It ought to bother you at times. If you got the word of God in you, it ought to bother you sometimes when you see things that's an abomination to God that goes against God's word. Not saying for it to bother you to bring some type of hatred in your heart, but it ought to make you shake your head. If you sit here and watch a commercial and you see two men kissing, it ought to shake your head. It ought to bother you or stir you up a little bit in your mind and say, what had this world came into? If you see around a group of people and they talking about a bunch of hatred, in the, whether it's politicians or whether it's by color or anything else, it ought to bother you a little bit because the word of God says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Things ought to bother you when you see something that's idol worship, when the picture is of Christ and the scripture says that thou shalt not have no graven images of me. Those things, some things ought to just stir you up. In Acts 17 chapter, Paul was stirred up when he came to Athens in his spirit because he saw all the idol worship that was around, that they were worshiping idols. So if you got the word of God in you, which is the Holy Spirit, it ought to teach you and tell you that you ought to be stirred up about certain things that you hear and certain things you see out there in the world. Amen. Amen. It's not to show that you need to be aggressive to someone. It's not showing that you need to be hatred to them, but it ought to stir you up and make you just shake your head and say, I don't know about this. But Abraham was mad when he saw the idols in his father's house. So Abraham asked his father, are these the gods that created heaven and earth and all of mankind? His father told him, yes. Scripture says, test the spirit. Do not believe every spirit. He says, test the spirit to see whether they are God. Abraham sat here and tested his father to see that which God is he worshiping and terror was worshiping idol gods. Abraham got mad and made the long story short. He took down all his statues, all of the idols, because he says, these idols have eyes in which they cannot see. They have hands which they cannot reach out. They have noses which they cannot smell. Why worship something that is made, is created by man's hand? Scripture says, don't worship the creation, but worship the creator, amen? We're too busy worshiping the creation, people. When I say we, I'm talking about the world. People worship their money. People worship their cause. People worship their jobs. And some people even worship their very own families. Jesus said, if you love your father and your mother before me, even your kids, you cannot be a part of mine. That means you got to love Christ first, amen? You love your family, but you don't put them above Christ, amen? That's the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He is the one and only one that is none before him and none after him. That we are to serve him first, amen? When Abraham refused to serve the idol gods, the scripture says in Genesis, the 12th chapter, God told Abraham, get up out of your country and leave your kindred. Now, when somebody tell you what God tell you to leave your family and leave your country, so we're in America, right? If God came to you and told you to go move to Canada, what you gonna do? You gonna look and question why? Why should I leave? But Abraham believed in God and stood for God and kept God over everything because God says, come out from among them 
And there's a scripture that says, come out from one thing and touch not an unclean thing. Some things you got to come out of, people. Some things that you got to put God first and put everything second in life. And Abraham was a kind of a righteous because the Bible says in Hebrews 11, chapter verse 8, that he was accounted for righteous because he left his family and he left his kindred. And Abraham was basically saying, if you're with me, you come in with me. If you're not, stay where you at. So who is on the Lord's side, people? Are you on the Lord's side or are you on the world's side? So there are some things in life, people, that gets very tough, even with family, family um, friends, even at the job, or even at church, that you had to put a difference to choose God over everything. Amen? Amen? Abraham, when he left, God made a covenant with him, and this is what's important to us. He said that I'm going to make you a father of a nation. He says I'm going to make other nations come to you to be as in one. He told him also that the seed that's going to come from your nations is going to bring all into one, which was talking about Jesus Christ through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is the founder of the 12 tribes of Israel that Jesus came through the tribe of Judah to bring all nations into one. And I'm going to get that. Everybody all right? He said, he gave him a covenant, told him that every man child that is born on the eighth day circumcised them. And that when you circumcise them, they are part of my covenant. He said that all men, that's no matter how old you are, if you want to be a part of this covenant, circumcise your flesh. So that means no matter if you are 30 years old, 50 years old, 80 years old, if you want to be a part of the Abraham covenant, you have to circumcise the flesh. Amen. He says, if you didn't circumcise and circumcise the flesh, you're not part of this covenant. So now what does that mean for us? That means to Jesus Christ that we're all nations, Jews and Gentiles, brought into one with him. Also, what it shows is that Scripture says in Jeremiah 4, 4, circumcise the heart and not of the flesh, meaning that men and women need to circumcise their hearts because women cannot get circumcised. So now it stands for women and men circumcise the flesh of your heart. That means that you have to come into the word of God. And in Acts the fifth chapter, it shows when the male gets circumcised, you got to get cut, right? So when you get cut by, you get cut by the word of God. In Acts the fifth chapter, that Peter was preaching and said that it cut them in their hearts. So when it cuts you in your heart, the word has to circumcise you. And when you circumcise in the flesh, you understand that what the covenant is, and the covenant is for Jesus Christ to be all into one, to be one nation, and that is the body of Christ. Amen? This is how Abraham is important to us. He believed. Let me ask you something. Do you believe the gospel? He believed the gospel. you got to believe what the Lord said to believe. You gotta make your covenant. He says, circumcise. Have you circumcised the flesh of your heart? Come to repentance. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to be a part of one. The scripture says there's only one spirit and there's only one body. One body. He told Abraham that I will make you a father of a nation, that many nations will come to you. Look up in the sky and count the stars, and that's how many uh, descendants that you will have. Now, Jesus said that there is other sheep that I must bring to this fold. That is, the Jews and the Gentiles all in one as in him to be circumcised through Jesus Christ. Amen? Be thankful that you're a part of that Abraham covenant. And if you want to understand Abraham, Jesus said in Matthew 8, chapter, verse 11, Many will come from the east and the west, and they will dwell at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? God promised Abraham a land. God is from us a land, which is the kingdom of heaven. God promised Abraham many descendants. We're all one body in Jesus Christ. God promised Abraham blessings. What is your blessing? That he gave you spare our eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that is how Abraham is appointed to us. Because the scripture says that if you are of Christ, you are Abraham's seed. So if you believe in Christ, you will have a covenant where it was blessed to Abraham. So we're not here to glorify Abraham. We're not here to praise him, but we are here to be thankful that we are part of Abraham's seed, which was given the covenant through him. Amen? Amen. All right. Next question is, what does it mean by casting pearls to swine, by casting not pearls to swine, 
um, and the dogs. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse six. All right, let me get to Matthew, seventh chapter, verse six. All right, Matthew seven chapter, verse six says, "Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you." All right. If we look at that a little bit before in this chapter, it was talking about judging one another, and that yes, judging one another. Uh, hypocrisy, and that when you have one in your very own eye, you need to judge yourself first. But do not catch your pearls before swine, meaning basically like you can't tell a person nothing sometimes. Basically, when you got something valuable and you're trying to teach someone and you're trying to help someone, is that you got pearls within you because pearls are like jewels, right? And so when you give pearls to the dogs or give pearls to the swine, what does a pig do? A pig likes to stay in mud. When you give something valuable to the swine, the swine loves to get right back in the mud and get it dirty. So it's good to try to help somebody in life with the word, but at times that you can say to yourself, as the scripture says, that some people you just can't help because you try to teach them and you try to help them. So there are some people in life that everyone knows that you can't tell them nothing. Man, you can tell them all you want to, but it ain't going to go nowhere. So this is what it means about do not cast your pearls before swine. And what it means by the dogs, you know, you got some dogs right here that are turning you, right? You got some dogs that you'll feed and they'll still turn around and bite you. So these are people you have to be careful for. Because dogs at that time was called as the Gentiles. The Jews called Gentile dogs because they were considered as unclean as other nations. They thought they were the only ones that was perfect. But Jesus says that there's neither Jew nor Greek nor a slave nor free, but all is one in Christ now. So some people you can't tell them, like I say, you just have to uh, keep on moving. As scripture says, just up your feet and keep on moving. Amen. All right. Everybody all right? If everybody got something to say or a question, you know, raise your hand or, you know, let's skip it and see what we can ask you. All right. Um, can we call God Jehovah still compared to Exodus 6 2? Can we call God Jehovah? Yes, you can call God Jehovah. Scripture even said that his name is Jehovah. But we have to understand he goes by a name that's above every other name. I understand this saying, I believe John the 19th chapter, verse 20, I believe it says, and I know it's in John the 19th chapter, it said that the words of the scriptures are written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. That means that Latin had their own way of saying words, Hebrew had their own way of saying words, and translated into English. And we know that English has a letter J, but in the Hebrew language, it does not have a letter J. It went by why? So when God says that I am that I am, it says that in the Lord spoke to Moses and said that I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob and by the name of God Almighty, but my name Jehovah, I was not known to them. The Hebrew name that I am that I am in Hebrew language is Yah, which is stands for Yahweh. And then we have Jehovah, which is, stands for Lord Almighty. All those things are just titles. But yes, you can address God in your prayer as Lord Jehovah or Yahweh, but he still goes by a name. I believe in Philippians, the second chapter, it says that every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord and every knee shall bow to that name. In the name of Jesus in Hebrew language is Yahshua. Now, Yahshua has Yah at the beginning, which means God. 
and Shua means Savior. So that means God saves. God is Savior. So this is why the angel gave Mary the name and said, you shall bear a son and you shall name him Jesus, which was Yeshua, which means God saves. So God has many titles, but he has one name that we must be saved by, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. And I always say this, in John the fifth chapter, verse 39, Jesus says, I come in my Father's name. So what was his name? Jesus. And so Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is God, and that is the name of God is Jesus. Amen? But yes, you can address him as Jehovah, but Jesus also said in John the 14th chapter is that when you pray unto the Father, you must pray in my name, letting you know that you got to use in the name of Jesus in your prayers. Amen? All right? In Galatians, the first chapter, verse 10, when it speaks about persuading men or persuading God, do I seek to praise man or seek to praise, please God? Amen. Galatians, the first chapter, verse 10. It says, For do not persuade men or God, I do, I seek to please men, but yet if I please men, I shouldn't be the servant. If I should not please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. All right. Peer pressure is the most thing that can happen to each and one of us, even especially to kids and teenagers, and even adults as well. But you're going to be put through a time to persuade men or to persuade God. In John 19, chapter verse 12, when Jesus was on trial, they told Pilate, if you let this man go, which was Jesus, we, you are not a friend of Caesar's. Pilate chose to be a pleaser of man rather than be a pleaser of God. And this is where it goes today as in politicians, leaders, and everything else. People will be quick to please man rather than God. If you think that you can do something to please the people and get your vote, you're going to do something to please man and then rather than God. If you think you can do something just to get beside a group, just to get them, you're going to do something to please man rather than God. You're going to have to stand your ground, people. And that's even me, myself, is that sometimes you're going to be put at a point. Either you're going to stand for God to persuade him or you're going to try to persuade men. People persuade men a lot because they want to feel not left out. And this is especially what I want to tell the kids and the young adults, or whoever it may be, is that, that at times, who cares if you're not a part of that group? Who cares? Sometimes it's good to be by yourself. If they don't accept you for who you are, to heck with them. Amen? You just got to get away from them. And that's why the scripture said, come out from a Monday. Long as you're standing for God, you're going to have people talk about you. You're going to have people look at you funny. You're going to have people that always want to say something in a negative way. Who cares? Yeah, it'll hurt your feelings, but don't do nothing out of ignorance just to be a part of a group. Amen? If a person and you're with a group and they say, let's go rob these people, you know in your mind that be kind of affectionate to one another. You know in your mind it's wrong, but just to be with your homeboys or your homegirls, you're going to ride with them and do these things. No, you stand back and everything, and don't be sweated by men because you rather please God rather than men. And Scripture just said that if you be a pleaser of men, you're no servant of Christ. Amen? So, every day we have to pick and choose. Scripture says that you cannot serve two masters. You either going to love one or hate the other. So who are you going to follow and who are you going to try to persuade in your life? Amen. All right. What do you think, or no, who do you think the two witnesses will be in the end times in Revelation, the 11th chapter? The 11th chapter of Revelation is talking about the right before the tribulation or during the tribulation period. It's right before when every man should be commanded to receive the mark of the beast from the Antichrist. There's going to be two witnesses that God is going to send on this earth, and that they're going to have power from God to try to pray to and please the people to come back to repentance before receiving this mark. That it says that in Revelation, the third chapter, Revelation, the eleventh chapter. Verse 3 says, I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. That's 1260 days 
41 months and they will be prophesied to the people to return unto the Lord. They will be wearing sackcloth. So that means they won't be wearing things like you see every other day people wear. They will be noticed out amongst the crowd in sackcloth. And if you know in the Old Testament, sackcloth was out of one because of ominous and of grievance. They was grieving that everybody was turning to the Antichrist. And so they trying to get everyone to repent before receiving this mark of the beast. Because if you receive the mark of the beast, there is no more hope. If you receive the mark of the beast, that is eternal damnation. That, that's going to be automatically. So here it is, right before this happened, is prophesied to the people. Change and don't receive this mark. So that's going to come a time a generation is either you going to live for, I mean, die for Christ or live for the devil. Because if you don't receive the mark, they're going to kill you. So it's going to be a time, a moment that you either die for Christ or live for the devil. It says that these two olive trees and these two canvases standing before God of the earth, talking about the two witnesses. Verse 5 says, says if any man will hurt them, Fire will proceed out of their mouth and devour their enemies. This is not talking about physical fire, that they can speak fire out of their mouth. Basically, it means that the judgment by the power of God, that they can speak something to existence and it would hurt them as well. Scripture says, Touch not thy anointing. This is why David then hurt Saul, because he knew he was anointed by God. So he dared not to kill him, because David had several times he could have killed Saul, but he didn't do it. So, touch not thy anointing. Amen. It says, if any man will hurt them, fire will proceed out of their mouth and fire them. And, and if any man will hurt them, he must in man be killed. These have the power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. The first witness a lot of people believe is going to be Elijah. Because in 1 Kings 17 chapter, Elijah prayed to the Lord to shut up rain for three and a half months. And it did not rain until Elijah prayed that it rained again. So we believe that Elijah will be the person that will come back. And another given clue is when Jesus was transfigured, that it was two people standing with him, and that was Elijah and that was Moses. So the people believe that these two witnesses are going to be Elijah and Moses that's going to come back at these end of times, of this time of tribulation. <laughs> so we got one clue is that one is going to be able to shut up the heavens and let it not rain. And then the other says, will I have over the power, over the waters, to turn them into blood and smite the earth with all plagues and often as they will. What did Moses do in the time of the plague of Pharaoh? He turned the water into blood. Also, he brought the plagues against Pharaoh. So this is the um, idea that Elijah and Moses would be the two witnesses. Now, can I confirm it? No. It don't say the actual the names who it's going to be, but it seems like it's giving clues who they might be. Some people say Elijah and Enoch or Elijah and Moses, but the clues will seem like they've written right here in Revelation 11 chapter. And it says that, and when they have finished their testimony of prophesying, the beast, which is the Antichrist, that was sent out of the bottom's um, pit, shall make war against them and kill them and shall overcome them. These two witnesses are going to get killed in the streets. And as scripture says that, and the people and the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the grave. They're going to hate them so much that they ain't going to desire to put them in the grave. They're going to hate them so much, they're just going to let them lie down the street. And it says, every eye shall see it. How can you see everything right now across the world? By TV and phone, right? You see everything that's going on around right the world. With TV and the phone. So everywhere right around the world is going to be looking at this and seeing this. And this is what's going to stun people. And it says that the people are going to rejoice over them and be happy and send gifts to one another because these two prophets are dead. And then it says after three and a half days, God is going to raise them from the dead. So they're going to raise from the dead off them streets and the people are going to be stunned when they see them get risen from the dead and walk. And when they walk, the Bible says that uh, a great um, call is going to come from heaven and it, it, it's going to ascend up to heaven. So now when people don't believe in the rapture, what do you mean you don't believe in the rapture? Because this is what God is going to do to them right here is that he's going to wake them up and then he's going to call them and they're going to ascend right there up into heaven. So if you don't believe in the rapture, it could very possibly happen at any given time where God can call 
for the first church. So that's why I say we always need to be prepared and be ready because the devil always trying to distract us that we miss our calling. Amen? Amen. Everybody all right? We good? All right, last question. Last question is about the old servant, the old saint. It is that how did Lucifer become Satan? All right. Lucifer became Satan because what was in his heart. In Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, you can see and read about what happened to Lucifer. Lucifer was his name as a high angel that was on the mountain of God. And Lucifer basically changed in the heart and became Satan. Scripture says in Ezekiel 28, verse 17, Thy heart was lifted up because of beauty and has corrupted thy wisdom or reason of brightness. He got beside himself. You know, people, we can't get beside ourselves with our beauty. We can't get beside ourselves with our positions. When no things get beside yourself, it takes over you. Because now you're not keeping your eyes on heavenly things. You're keeping your eyes on earthly things. When the devil possesses you, he gets in your mind. When he gets in your mind, it goes to the heart. It's just like when a venomous snake bites you. When a venomous snake bites you, his venom goes through your veins. And when the bloodstream goes, where does it go to? It goes to the heart. And when he gets to the heart, it makes the attack on his prey. And this is what the devil tried to do, is that he tried to attack the mind to where he hits your heart. When he got your heart, he got you. Because when you think it, you think it what you want to do. But when it hits your heart, you're going to do it. Amen? Jesus even said, out of our heart come the deceiver. So what's up in a man's heart will come out. Amen? You can, you can try to fool people all you want. But whatever's in your heart is going to eventually come out. Whatever's in your heart is going to eventually speak out and say it and everything. All you got to do is just pay attention to what's in a person's heart. It will come out. It says that his heart was full with iniquity. So Lucifer lost his name and became Satan. And he was kicked out of heaven. And Revelation is the 12th chapter was starting a war in heaven and took the third of angels with him. And so... Lucifer has been kicked out of heaven to weaken the nations. And this is what's going on today. This is what he's doing. Weaken the nations. That's what he's doing. Attacking the people. And this is why we're going through all these things. You can see this in uh, Isaiah 14 chapter. You can see this in Ezekiel the 28th chapter. And this is his job is to weaken the nations that he was cut down to the ground. Satan has many titles. He's called the old servant. He's called the red dragon. He is called Satan. He is called Lucifer. But he is the enemy that we all need to try to stay away from. He is the enemy that's trying to keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. He is the enemy that's trying to keep us from connecting to Christ. Amen. So be thankful to God that he gives you the word. Be thankful that he opened up your eyes that you may see what the Lord is trying to say. The enemy is always on attack. He's like a roaring lion seeking who he made the vow. Amen. All right. That was the end of the portions of that. And I hope everybody got somebody there that may know knowing of these things because, you know, it's good to ask questions. A lot of people are full of questions, but we just don't ask questions. But anybody have any questions in the way? All right, well, we're going to get ready to close this out, and 